John F. Kennedy, in full John Fitzgerald Kennedy, by name JFK, born May 29, 1917, Brookline, Massachusetts, U.S. died November 22, 1963, Dallas, Texas, 35th President of the United States, 1961-63, to face a number of foreign crises, especially in Cuba and Berlin but managed to secure such achievements as the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the Alliance for Progress. He was assassinated while riding in a motorcade in Dallas, early life. The second of nine children, Kennedy was reared in a family that demanded intense physical and intellectual competition among the siblings. The family's touch football games at their high Port retreat later became legendary and was schooled in the religious teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and the political precepts of the Democratic Party. His father, Joseph Patrick Kennedy, had acquired a multi-million dollar fortune in banking, bootlegging, shipbuilding, and the film industry, and as a skilled player of the stock market. His mother, Rouse, was the daughter of John F. Honey Fitz, Fitzgerald, one-time mayor of Boston. They established trust funds for their children that guaranteed lifelong financial independence. After serving as the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Joseph Kennedy became the U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain, and for six months in 1938 John served as his secretary, drawing on that experience to write his senior thesis at Harvard University, B.S., 1940, on Great Britain's military unpreparedness. He then expanded that thesis into a best-selling book, Why England Slept, 1940. In the fall of 1941 Kennedy joined the U.S. Navy and two years later was sent to the South Pacific. By the time he was discharged in 1945, his older brother, Joe, who their father had expected would be the first Kennedy to run for office, had been killed in the war, and the family's political standard passed to John who had planned to pursue an academic or journalistic career. John Kennedy himself had barely escaped death in battle. Commanding a patrol torpedo PT, boat, he was gravely injured when a Japanese destroyer sank it in the Solomon Islands. Marooned far behind enemy lines, he led his men back to safety and was awarded the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps Medal for Heroism. He also returned to active command at his own request. These events were later depicted in a Hollywood film, PT-109, 1963, that contributed to the Kennedy mystique, however, the further injury to his back, which had bothered him since his teens, never really healed. Despite operations in 1944, 1954, and 1955, he was in pain for much of the rest of his life. He also suffered from Madison disease, though this affliction was publicly concealed. At least one half of the days he spent on this earth, wrote his brother Robert, were days of intense physical pain. After he became president, Kennedy combated the pain with injections of amphetamines, then thought to be harmless and used by more than a few celebrities for their energizing effect. According to some reports, both Kennedy and the First Lady became heavily dependent on these injections through weekly use, none of this prevented Kennedy from undertaking a strenuous life in politics. His family expected him to run for public office and to win, congressman and senator. Kennedy did not disappoint his family, in fact, he never lost an election. His first opportunity came in 1946, when he ran for Congress. Although still physically weak from his war injuries, he campaigned aggressively, bypassing the Democratic organization in the Massachusetts 11th Congressional District and depending instead upon his family, college friends and fellow Navy officers. In the Democratic primary he received nearly double the vote of his nearest opponent, in the November election he overwhelmed the Republican candidate. He was only 29. Kennedy served three terms in the House of Representatives, 1947-53, as a bread-and-butter liberal. He advocated better working conditions, more public housing, higher wages, lower prices, cheaper rents and more social security for the aged. In foreign policy he was an early supporter of Cold War policies. He backed the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan but was sharply critical of the Truman administration's record in Asia. He accused the State Department of trying to force Chiang Kai-shek into a coalition with Mao Zedong. What our young men had saved, 
he told the House on January 25, 1949, our diplomats and our president have frittered away. His congressional district in Boston was a safe seat, but Kennedy was too ambitious to remain long in the House of Representatives. In 1952 he ran for the U.S. Senate against the popular incumbent, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. His mother and sisters Eunice, Patricia, and Jean held Kennedy tees across the state. Thousands of volunteers flocked to help, including his 27-year-old brother Robert, who managed the campaign. That fall the Republican presidential candidate, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, carried Massachusetts by 208,000 votes, but Kennedy defeated Lodge by 70,000 votes. Less than a year later, on September 12, 1953, Kennedy enhanced his electoral appeal by marrying Jacqueline Lee Bouvier, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Twelve years younger than Kennedy and from a socially prominent family, the beautiful Jackie was the perfect complement to the handsome politician, they made a glamorous couple. As a senator, Kennedy quickly won a reputation for responsiveness to requests from constituents, except on certain occasions when the national interest was at stake. In 1954 he was the only New England senator to approve an extension of President Eisenhower's reciprocal trade powers, and he vigorously backed the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway, despite the fact that over a period of 20 years no Massachusetts senator or congressman had ever voted for it. To the disappointment of liberal Democrats, Kennedy soft-pedaled the demagogic excesses of Senator Joseph R. McCarthy of Wisconsin who in the early 1950s conducted witch-hunting campaigns against government workers accused of being communists. Kennedy's father liked McCarthy, contributed to his campaign, and even entertained him in the family's compound at Hyannis Port on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Kennedy himself disapproved of McCarthy, but, as he once observed, half my people in Massachusetts look on McCarthy as a hero. Yet, on the Senate vote over condemnation of McCarthy's conduct, 1954, Kennedy expected to vote against him. He prepared a speech explaining why, but he was absent on the day of the vote. Later, at a National Press Club gridiron dinner, costumed reporters sang, Where were you, John, where were you, John, when the Senate censured Joe? Actually, John had been in a hospital, in critical condition, after back surgery. For six months afterward he lay strapped to a board in his father's house in Palm Beach, Florida. It was during this period that he worked on Profiles in Courage, 1956, an account of eight great American political leaders who had defied popular opinion in matters of conscience, which was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in 1957. Although Kennedy was credited as the book's author, it was later revealed that his assistant Theodore Sorensen had done much of the research and writing. Back in the Senate, Kennedy led a fight against a proposal to abolish the Electoral College, crusaded for labor reform, and became increasingly committed to civil rights legislation. As a member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations in the late 1950s, he advocated extensive foreign aid to the emerging nations in Africa and Asia, and he surprised his colleagues by calling upon France to grant Algerian independence. During these years his political outlook was moving leftward. Possibly because of their father's dynamic personality, the sons of Joseph Kennedy matured slowly. Gradually John's stature among Democrats grew, until he had inherited the legions that had once followed Governor Atlee E. Stevenson of Illinois, the two-time presidential candidate who by appealing to idealism had transformed the Democratic Party and made Kennedy's rise possible, presidential candidate and president. Kennedy had nearly become Stevenson's vice presidential running mate in 1956. The charismatic young New Englander's near victory in his televised speech of concession, Estes Kefauver won the vice presidential nomination, brought him into some 40 million American homes. Overnight he had become one of the best-known political figures in the country. Already his campaign for the 1960 nomination had begun. One newspaper man called him a young man in a hurry. Kennedy felt that he had to redouble his efforts because of the widespread conviction that no Roman Catholic candidate could be elected president. He made his 1958 race for re-election to the Senate a test of his popularity in Massachusetts. His margin of victory was 874,608 votes, 
the largest ever in Massachusetts politics and the greatest of any senatorial candidate that year. A steady stream of speeches and periodical profiles followed, with photographs of him and his wife appearing on many a magazine cover. Kennedy's carefully calculated pursuit of the presidency years before the first primary established a practice that became the norm for candidates seeking the nation's highest office. To transport him and his staff around the country, his father bought a 40-passenger Convair aircraft. His brothers Robert, Bobby, or Bob, and Edward, Teddy, or Ted, pitched in. After having graduated from Harvard University, 1948, and from the University of Virginia Law School, 1951, Bobby had embarked on a career as a Justice Department attorney and counselor for congressional committees. Ted likewise had graduated from Harvard, 1956, and from Virginia Law School, 1959. Both men were astute campaigners. In January 1960 John F. Kennedy formally announced his presidential candidacy. His chief rivals were the Senators Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota and Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas. Kennedy knocked Humphrey out of the campaign and dealt the religious taboo against Roman Catholics a blow by winning the primary in Protestant West Virginia. He tackled the Catholic issue again, by avowing his belief in the separation of church and state in a televised speech before a group of Protestant ministers in Houston, Texas. Nominated on the first ballot, he balanced the Democratic ticket by choosing Johnson as his running mate. In his acceptance speech Kennedy declared, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. Thereafter the phrase new frontier was associated with his presidential programs. Another phrase, the Kennedy style encapsulated the candidate's emerging identity. It was glamorous and elitist, an amalgam of his father's wealth, John Kennedy's charisma and easy wit, Jacqueline Kennedy's beauty and fashion sense, the suits and pillbox hats she wore became widely popular, the charm of their children and relatives and the erudition of the Harvard advisors who surrounded him, called the best and brightest by author David Halberstam. Kennedy won the general election, narrowly defeating the Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, by a margin of less than 120,000 out of some 70 million votes cast. Many observers, then and since, believed vote fraud contributed to Kennedy's victory, especially in the critical state of Illinois where Joe Kennedy enlisted the help of the ever-powerful Richard J. Daley, mayor of Chicago. Nixon had defended the Eisenhower record, Kennedy, whose slogan had been let's get this country moving again, had deplored unemployment, the sluggish economy, the so-called missile gap, a presumed Soviet superiority over the United States in the number of nuclear-armed missiles, and the new communist government in Havana. A major factor in the campaign was a unique series of four televised debates between the two men, an estimated 85 to 120 million Americans watched one or more of the debates. Both men showed a firm grasp of the issues, but Kennedy's poise in front of the camera, his Tony Harvard accent, and his good looks, in contrast to Nixon's five o'clock shadow, convinced many viewers that he had won the debate. As president, Kennedy continued to exploit the new medium sparkling in precedent-setting televised weekly press conferences. He was the youngest man and the first Roman Catholic ever elected to the presidency of the United States. His administration lasted 1,037 days. From the onset he was concerned with foreign affairs. In his memorable inaugural address, he called upon Americans to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle dot against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease and war itself," he declared. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility, I welcome it. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country. The administration's first brush with foreign affairs was a disaster. In the last year of the Eisenhower presidency, the Central Intelligence Agency CIA, had equipped and trained a brigade of anti-communist Cuban exiles for an invasion of their homeland. 
The Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously advised the new president that this force, once ashore, would spark a general uprising against the Cuban leader, Fidel Castro. But the Bay of Pigs invasion was a fiasco, every man on the beachhead was either killed or captured. Kennedy assumed sole responsibility for the setback. Privately he told his father that he would never again accept a Joint Chief's recommendation without first challenging it. The Soviet Premier, Nikita Khrushchev, thought he had taken the young president's measure when the two leaders met in Vienna in June 1961. Khrushchev ordered a wall built between East and West Berlin and threatened to sign a separate peace treaty with East Germany. The president activated National Guard and Reserve units, and Khrushchev backed down on his separate peace threat. Kennedy then made a dramatic visit to West Berlin, where he told a cheering crowd, Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich benign, I am a, Berliner. In October 1962 a buildup of Soviet short- and intermediate-range nuclear missiles was discovered in Cuba. Kennedy demanded that the missiles be dismantled, he ordered a quarantine of Cuba, in effect, a blockade that would stop Soviet ships from reaching that island. For 13 days nuclear war seemed near, then the Soviet premier announced that the offensive weapons would be withdrawn. See Cuban Missile Crisis, 10 months later Kennedy scored his greatest foreign triumph when Khrushchev and Prime Minister Harold Macmillans of Great Britain joined him in signing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Yet Kennedy's commitment to combat the spread of communism led him to escalate American involvement in the conflict in Vietnam, where he sent not just supplies and financial assistance, as President Eisenhower had, but 15,000 military advisors as well. Because of his slender victory in 1960, Kennedy approached Congress warily, and with good reason, Congress was largely indifferent to his legislative program. It approved his Alliance for Progress, Alianza, in Latin America and his Peace Corps, which won the enthusiastic endorsement of thousands of college students. But his two most cherished projects, massive income tax cuts and a sweeping civil rights measure, were not passed until after his death. In May 1961 Kennedy committed the United States to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade, and, while he would not live to see this achievement either, his advocacy of the space program contributed to the successful launch of the first American manned space flights. He was an immensely popular president, at home and abroad. At times he seemed to be everywhere at once, encouraging better physical fitness, improving the morale of government workers, bringing brilliant advisors to the White House, and beautifying Washington, D.C. His wife joined him as an advocate for American culture. Their two young children, Carolyn Bouvier and John F. Jr., were familiar throughout the country. The charm and optimism of the Kennedy family seemed contagious, sparking the idealism of a generation for whom the Kennedy White House became, in journalist Theodore White's famous analogy, Camelot, the magical court of Arthurian legend, which was celebrated in a popular Broadway musical of the early 1960s. Joseph Kennedy, meanwhile, had been incapacitated in Hyannis Port by a stroke, but the other Kennedys were in and out of Washington. Robert Kennedy, as John's Attorney General, was the second most powerful man in the country. He advised the President on all matters of foreign and domestic policy, national security, and political affairs. In 1962 Ted Kennedy was elected to the President's former Senate seat in Massachusetts. Their sister Eunice's husband, Sergeant Shriver, became director of the Peace Corps. Their sister Jean's husband, Stephen Smith, was preparing to manage the Democratic Party's 1964 presidential campaign. Another sister, Patricia, had married Peter Lawford, an English-born actor who served the family as an unofficial envoy to the entertainment world. All Americans knew who Rose, Jackie, Bobby, and Teddy were and most could identify Bobby's wife as Ethel and Teddy's wife as Joan. But if the first family had become American royalty, its image of perfection would be tainted years later by allegations of marital infidelity by the president, most notably, an affair with motion picture icon Marilyn Monroe, and of his association with members of organized crime, assassination of John F. Kennedy. President Kennedy believed that his Republican opponent in 1964 would be Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona. 
he was convinced that he could bury Goldwater under an avalanche of votes, thus receiving a mandate for major legislative reforms. One obstacle to his plan was a feud in Vice President Johnson's home state of Texas between Governor John B. Connolly Jr. and Senator Ralph Yarborough, both Democrats. To present a show of unity, the president decided to tour the state with both men. On Friday, November 22, 1963, he and Jacqueline Kennedy were in an open limousine riding slowly in a motorcade through downtown Dallas. At 12.30 p.m. the president was struck by two rifle bullets, one at the base of his neck and one in the head. He was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Governor Connolly, though also gravely wounded, recovered. Vice President Johnson took the oath as president at 2.38 p.m. Lee Harvey Oswald, a 24-year-old Dallas citizen, was accused of this laying. Two days later Oswald was shot to death by Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner with connections to the criminal underworld, in the basement of a Dallas police station. A presidential commission headed by the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, later found that neither the sniper nor his killer was part of any conspiracy, domestic or foreign, to assassinate President Kennedy but that Oswald had acted alone. The Warren Commission, however, was not able to convincingly explain all the particular circumstances of Kennedy's murder. In 1979 a special committee of the U.S. House of Representatives declared that although the president had undoubtedly been slain by Oswald, acoustic analysis suggested the presence of a second gunman who had missed. But this declaration did little to squelch the theories that Oswald was part of a conspiracy involving either CIA agents angered over Kennedy's handling of the Bay of Pigs fiasco or members of organized crime seeking revenge for Attorney General Bobby Kennedy's relentless criminal investigations. Kennedy's assassination, the most notorious political murder of the 20th century, remains a source of bafflement, controversy, and speculation. John Kennedy was dead but the Kennedy mystique was still alive. Both Robert and Ted ran for president, in 1968 and 1980, respectively. Yet tragedy would become nearly synonymous with the Kennedys when Bobby, too, was assassinated on the campaign trail in 1968. Jacqueline Kennedy and her two children moved from the White House to a home in the Georgetown section of Washington. Continuing crowds of the worshipful and curious made peace there impossible, however, and in the summer of 1964 she moved to New York City. Pursuit continued until October 20, 1968, when she married Aristotle Onassis, a wealthy Greek shipping magnate. The Associated Press said that the marriage broke the spell of almost complete adulation of a woman who had become virtually a legend in her own time. Widowed by Onassis, the former first lady returned to the public eye in the mid-1970s as a high-profile book editor and she remained among the most admired women in the United States until her death in 1994. As an adult, daughter Caroline was jealous of her own privacy, but John Jr., a lawyer like his sister and debonair and handsome like his father, was much more of a public figure. Long remembered as John John, the three-year-old who stoically saluted his father's casket during live television coverage of the funeral procession, John Jr. became the founder and editor-in-chief of the political magazine George in the mid-1990s. In 1999, when John Jr., his wife, and his sister-in-law died in the crash of the private plane he was piloting, the event was the focus of an international media watch that further proved the immortality of the Kennedy mystique. It was yet another chapter in the family's curse of tragedy.